were on the corner of Aberdeen Walk and, 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 and Westborough as a busker. And, and unlike, because I'm really mean spiritually, and I don't usually... Uh, well, I, I support buskers if they're doing something different. I don't support buskers if they're just churning out old things that sound exactly the same as uh, everybody else has done them. But when I, I spotted Eliza, I immediately knew who she was. But I thought she was going to do something different, so I, I, I throw money into her hat. So I, I like to think I inspired her career. Uh, <laughs> when you said you were mean spirited, I thought you were going to tell, tell us that you were the person that dobbed me into the police. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't want to be grandiose, but I would never do that. I, I, I tried my best and my humble means to support you. Anyway, um, like I said, my name is Richard Pearson. I'm a, a former employee of the BBC. I worked in music journalism as well. I worked uh, on BBC radio and television for many years and worked with a lot of wonderful musicians, including Martin, when he was a member of the Elgin Band. And he's probably forgotten that, having Martin. <laughs> and uh, to open, I think, you know, to give us a bit of context, what I'd like to ask Martin is. At what point and, and, and why did you decide to become a professional musician? Um, I didn't really, I don't, I don't, what I wanted to do was to, to when I was 17 I, I, I was uh, invited to go along as, as a protector of this person who had um, dragged his way onto a, a, a concert at a place called the Ballads and Blues which was uh, it, it was a movable feast. You just had to listen, listen to the drums, and find out where it was next week. And this place was <coughs> right. Uh, the, the pub has now disappeared. Uh, I think it's underneath the, the, the flyover that goes from uh, uh, Marylebone Road across to uh, the um, the. What do you call it? It's, it's a. a it's a road to the N40, it's an elevated highway for going, going west for ages. Do you want me to pull that mark? Okay, there okay. we go. <coughs> but and I can't remember what the pub was called. Um, but it was the, the Ballads and Blues was a club run by um, Ewan McCall and Bert Lloyd. <coughs> and on this particular night, this, uh, this person that uh, I... I followed, uh, and that was because he knew more songs than me, and he was uh, he was fairly charismatic. Um, but he was uh, he was a, a noted fraud. Uh, <laughs> later on, I found um, had got himself onto the bill by saying, um, I, "I've just been in Canada collecting folk songs for the last five years, and of course, you know, this is gold. This, this is the late 1950s." So, so you and Nicole said, yes, come along. We've, I, said, I, I said, I don't know who else is on the, uh, that, that night. That's what my, I'll call him my friend, um, said. He said, oh, no, we have, we have a, wonderful, a, a wonderful singer come from, uh, from, from, uh, from Great Yarmouth. He's a, a retired herring fisherman. His name is Sam Lana. Uh, so my friend said, oh, that, that's very interesting. And when I asked him about it, he said he's some silly old bugger who's he's, he's, he's probably 80 years old. He's, 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 he's not all there, probably. And he'll, he'll sing completely out of tune. He hasn't got any teeth. You, know, you can come along if you want. But I, I, I'd really like you to come. So I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. Because uh, I imagined that, well, I, I didn't know, but uh, I, I think he was taking me as, as, as a sort of tame punch bag for when you and McCall lost his temper and beat him up. But what he wasn't about to, 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 to understand was that Ewan McCall was 
about to show off, about to show everybody his favourite uh, English traditional singer, old man. And these were fairly rare birds in those days. The uh, the two that were best known were Sam Lana and uh, and, and Harry Cox, who lived just a coffin a spit up the road, who was a truly beautiful singer. Sam was passion. Um, and he, uh, Harry Cox was oh, just precision, beautiful singer, well into his 70s, if not his early 80s, but by God he could sing. Um, and I never got to meet him, but I did get to meet Sam Lana, and I, I was completely blown away as a 17-year-old by the passion of this old man. Um, Ewan McCall didn't sing all night. My mate sang, for, sang five songs and was sort of dismissed with a big smile. And, uh, and Sam proceeded to, to, to sing every song. And he had been staying with Ewan McCall, so uh, they, they'd choreographed the whole evening between them. Well, or rather, Ewan had, had choreographed the whole evening and did a brilliant job. He didn't sing himself. He, uh, he, he wanted everybody to hear the, the, um, the maximum of Sam. And, but by the time the evening was over, I was, I was going to, that's what I'm going to do. So it was, it was a, as far as I'm concerned, it was a life-changing moment. I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. And it was the passion of the man that did it. Well, at the age of 15 or 16, 16 I went I to my first professional <laughs> gig. And uh, we talked about it backstage. We can't work out exactly where it was. But the person featured was Martin Carthy. And um, it was at a folk club somewhere near the Hedrow in Leeds. And it was the first time I'd actually ventured out to do one of these gigs. It, it sounds normal now, but in those days, people didn't go to gigs and they stayed were part of the circuit. I mean, to me, a kid living on the outskirts of, of Leeds, this was really exciting to go into the middle of Leeds go to a folk club and hear somebody perform. And I was lucky enough to discover Martin. And um, I, we were talking and I, I said, you know, obviously it's a long time ago now, about 150 years ago, I think. Um, but the song that stood out for me and the song that I really, really remembered and made a big impression on me was Martin's performance of Prince Heathen. Uh, which you may or may not know. If you don't know, go and buy some of his records. You'll find, you'll find it on several of them, I think. Um, but Martin said to me that song was really special to him. So explain why it was so special to you, Martin. Well, when I, when I started <coughs> singing around the clubs, it was... Uh, we, we, the division was, was between folk singers and singers of folk songs. It's a... It's, uh, that, that's how it was then, and, um, and we were obliged to. I was obliged to say, I'm not really a folk singer. I'm a singer of folk songs. The, 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 the folk singers were people like Sam Lana, and there were other others had been discovered and recorded. Um, one or two, I mean, had been recorded <coughs> back before the First World War. Um, and the BBC did, did, did a lot of recording in the, in the late 40s and early 50s. And there's some wonderful stuff in, in, the, uh, in the BBC Sound Archive. Um, what changed everything for me, that the moment I... I it was the first... No, right, yeah. Prince Heathen was the very first time I ever changed a song. I changed its intent because I was utter. I remember reading the song, and it's well in, in, in modern modern terms, it's about its domestic abuse. And um, I, I read the song, and when I got to the end, I thought, "You can't finish a song like that," um, because what happens is that uh, that she, that she suddenly agrees to every all his demands, and they live happily ever after. I'm thinking. You can't do that. No. After, after the, what, 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 what he has done is he's raped her. He's, he's um, told her that, that, uh, that, that she, she's worthless, that he uh, killed, that, he, that she had seven brothers and he drowned every one of them in, in, in the sea. 
uh, that he, he killed, her, killed, killed her father, he killed her mother, um, um, and after, after each confession, he says, Lady, will you weep for me? Lady, tell me true. And she replies, Never, sh- never yet, you heathen dog, and never shall for you. And it goes through, and she, he, he finally locks her in in, in, a, in a in a in a in a in a what's the in a place of stone in a, I can't remember, in a dungeon. Uh, dungeon. Did, lock, lock, yeah, he locks her up in a, in a, in a place made of stone, and he says, uh, "I'll be back later. Um, you, you, you don't get you, you don't get. She doesn't get to eat, but uh, she just survives." Um, and he comes back later on when she's very, very pregnant, and uh, says, uh, "How are you? How are you doing?" And she says, um, I'm, I'm, "I'm dying." And he says, uh, "Well, will you weep for me now?" And he says, "Never, never yet, you heathen dog, and never shall for you." She then goes. She, she then goes into labour, and he lays her out on the ground, and all his merry men, all his merry men, stand around while she's giving birth. And, and basically laugh at her, that laugh and joke, and whoa, that's hilarious, isn't it? Wow. And he's there saying, Lady, will you weep for me? Lady, tell me true. Never yet, you heathen dog, and never shall for you. She gives birth, and she asks him for a, for, for a, a silken sheet to, to wrap, the, wrap the baby in. And he, he gives her a, a, an old horse blanket and he wraps the baby up in it and the baby starts to cry and she starts to cry and she says, oh lady, now you weep for me. And she said, no, 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 never now for you. Never, <laughs> lady, will you weep? Lady, do you weep for me? Lady, tell me too. Never yet, you heathen dog, and never now for you. Could you not give any better thing than a horse blanket or a sheet to wrap and swaddle your own young son that lies in your arms asleep? And he then sort of suddenly melts and says, and he wraps her up in, in, in lovely silken clothes and, and puts her in a, a, a beautiful green bed. That's what the song calls it. A beautiful green bed. And says, yeah, finally done. Now is the time. Now you can weep for me. And she says, and, and, she's, and she does. She then said, oh, all right, yes, ha, ha, ha. We can live, you know, live together and keep white mice. Okay, the song doesn't say that, but... That's what happened. And I got to that last verse and I just said to myself, no, this can't, this can't be true. Somebody's been messing about with this song. It's time that I started messing about with it. And it was the first time I'd ever messed about with something that was supposed to be sort of holy writ in its own way. Um, and th- I decided it had to be a, 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 neg- a negative response song. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, yeah, I'd, be, I'd been to see the, the film Waltz of the Toreadors. And uh, I don't know if any of, any of you have ever seen it. It was Peter Sellers playing this old man. Um, and I can't, I can't remember the name of the woman who was playing that other, other part. Anybody and, remember it? Anybody know the film? No. Nope. It's. I mean, it's. 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 It's a tremendous film. And I went home and sat with my mum, and I said, "That's outrageous. That, what, what that man does, and, and 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 he gets away with it." And she said, "That's what you're supposed to think. You're supposed to get angry because that's what is it written by Anwy, also the Toreadors? It is Anwy, isn't it? Thank you. Um, and he said, and that's the kind of game he plays. You, you your reaction is absolutely dead on." And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to be angry and, ch- and, 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 and take the message and pass it on. And I decided that Prince Heathen was, was, was tradition speaking like that. And the answer has to be no. And somebody had changed it and given you a happy, a happy ending. Um, Liza came up with, with, with another... A happy ending. What was that one? What was the one? What was the one? The happy ending. What of one of one of my songs? It, it, it was the song. Oh, the song. The song was a thing called Bonnie Susie Cleland, and uh, the the, uh, the the end of each verse is Bonnie Susie Cleland is to be burned in Dundee, and she's to be burned because she fell in love with an Englishman. Um, and this this friend of ours called Edith Kent, who was a sensational singer, sang it. And we just sat there. 
mouths open at the end of it. And then there were, there were some reactions at the end. And one was from somebody who said, oh, I heard the version where it's a happy ending. It's a, it's a, I, I like that version. And, <laughs> and Liza had sent this response, it's a murder ballad. <laughs> That's what it's about. I mean, that, I mean, a lot of those traditional songs are, are not comfortable. Yeah, they're, they're not supposed they're to be. They're telling them. Yeah, they're, they're not supposed to be. They're not yeah. and they are not supposed to be. They're, they're, they are warnings. They are they're lessons to be learned. Allah and we, and so on. But I, that was the first time I changed a song, and I decided that what was actually I, I, I now look back on it, and I think that periodically. Traditional, traditional music, traditional song in this country has been reappraised. And sometimes very successfully, there's stuff done by Bishop Percy, Percy's Relics, um, which I find detestable. Um, just messing around with it and, and, and making everybody comfortable. And the stuff is not to make you comfortable. It really is not. It's very important. That, 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 they, they discom that they discomfort you and you are, you take the lesson away and learn it. That's what I think anyway. And I think what's happening now is that people like me and Liza and the people who are, have come after us are taking hold of this music and reappraising it. And it's not a question of bringing it up to date. It is up to date. If you sing, sing a song that's 800 years old, it's a modern song. You're giving, you're trying to give the same lesson because those very old songs deliver lessons, and some of them are some of them are hard to do. That's what I think. As I'm sure you're beginning to realise, we could go on for hours, <laughs> and we can't do that this evening. But Eliza and I are plotting, and um, one of our plots is to organise a Waterson family audio archive, uh, which will include a lot more of this sort of thing. It's in its early stages yet, so bear with us, but uh, it, it, it's something we're, we're plotting, isn't it? We've talked about it, and uh, it, it might come to fruition, because I, I think these stories that Martin's telling are so important about how music changes organically and where it came from, how it moves, where it goes to, etc., etc. And uh, there's just not enough of, of that sort of thing available. But we're going to move to Eliza now. And um, Eliza, your mum was a professional musician, your dad was a professional musician. Why the hell didn't you become a solicitor? <laughs> I think if I'd become an accountant, it might have been. <laughs> it might have been, yeah, either a solicitor or an accountant might have, might have helped us out more than, than my life choices up to this point, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Well, expand upon it. You know, you could have been a doctor, you're a very intelligent woman. What, what was it that made what possessed you want me? to follow <laughs> in the footsteps of, of two people when you knew, or, or, you know, all the Hunter S. Thompson uh, caveats that are involved in the music industry? Like, whatever happens, even if you're wildly successful, you're still going to get ripped off. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, when I was growing up, when, when I was growing up uh, uh, on the farm on Filandale's Moor, I was very... I was, I was indoctrinated into the sort of traditional music side of things before I started to consider the idea of the music industry, put it that way. I was very, very into the idea that there are... There are seven generations of musicians on my dad's side of the family. There's unknown, unknown generations on mum's side of the family uh, because my mum's side of the family were travellers initially. Um, and I, I bought into everything my parents ever said about, con about continuity, about the sort of the unbroken thread idea and about the fact that it was multi-generational. Um, so it felt natural to be taking the traditional music and putting it into a new generation because that's what they did and that's how traditional music worked. Um, they never 
foisted on me the idea that I was that I was going to take on some some sort of monument to music. It wasn't about that. It was about the fact that it was alive, it was generational, it was our family, it was our culture. Um, and I just thought that I thought that was fantastic. Um, after a while, after a while, I did start to to think about the industry per se. But that was after I'd been on the road with them. I mean, I I, I went on the road with with Lal and my mom. That's Lal Waterson and my mom Norma Waterson and my cousin Mary Waterson as the Water Daughters. We went on the road when I was thirteen. Um, I fell out with my best friend in the village, and I was. I'd had, I had one friend from when, I was, from when I was four years old, and when I was 13, we fell apart catastrophically, as teenagers full of hormones will do. And I was incredibly unhappy, and my mum said, ah, just come and, come and do some gigs with us. And again, it, it, was, it was natural, it was family, it was continuity, it was all of those things. And I'm afraid the kicker, what did it, he's waiting for me to tell him about the kicker, I can see it on his face. They made the mistake of taking me to the Vancouver Folk Music Festival in 1989. Um, and there was 30,000 people on Jericho, Jericho Beach Park in Vancouver with the sun going down over the mountains and this huge stage on which I saw for the first time African music, New Orleans, jazz, um, just, oh, I saw Buffy St. Marie and her band who were also made up of family members I saw, you know, I saw Eastern European singers. We, we were hanging out with this, uh, hanging out with this Bulgarian band, and it just blew my mind that there was a global stage for culture and for multi generational music and for roots music. And I came off stage, came off the main stage, and <laughs> I looked at my, I looked at my dad and I looked at my mum and I went, right, that's it. I'm leaving school and I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And they said, no, you're not. It's illegal. You have to stay at school till you release 16. And actually, I did manage. I managed to 17. The thing, that, exactly the same as exactly the same as dad. And what what happened is, uh, I went to Scarborough Six, and. Um, that's when I used to I used to busk in my lunch hours basically. But I went to Scarborough Six Form, and I missed the end of the first year because uh, when I was younger I had very chronic asthma and I got pneumonia and actually one of my lungs collapsed. And I was in hospital. I was in the hospital here for um, well, two three weeks I think altogether. So I missed out a big chunk of the end of the first year. So when I came back for the second year, I, I hadn't done any of my coursework. I was doing music A-level, and there was tons of coursework in, involved in that, you know, writing symphonies and, and sonatas and all kinds of stuff. And I was sitting in the... It was, it was March, um, just before the exams, you know, were, were start. It was all building up towards the exams and stuff. And I was sitting in one of the rehearsal rooms in the, in the college and I, I was sat just staring at an empty score in front of me, an, an empty piece of paper, empty stave, like that. And I sat there for about an hour and I'd written like, I, I was sat playing, I used to play, a, piano was, was my first instrument. Sat, you know, wrote like maybe a one line or something like that. And my, my, uh, my teacher came in and he said, he said, um, are, you, are you getting on with it? And I said... And I said, no, I'm just not. And he'd given me so much extra time. He was a lovely, he was a lovely man. And, uh, and I said, no, I, I haven't. And I stood up and I went, and if I'm honest, I'm not going to. I can't see it. I just can't see it. As it turned out, we had a tour, Waters and Carthy, uh, that was just starting out, had a tour in the, in, in the US in that November. And I just didn't want to reset. I knew I was going to fail. And I didn't want to reset it, and I just stood up and I said, I'm, I'm not doing this. And I went home and I never went back. <laughs> At which point, I'm going to let him take her, because he loves telling this bit. I was, I was away in the USA, and I got, got this phone call, and uh, it, was, it was Norma. And she said, you need to have a word. It was, it was, it, it's the famous, it's, it's, it's one of those... You need to have a word with your daughter. <laughs> and I said, what happened? She said, she's left school. And I said, what do you expect me to say? 
She's left school, she's 17. I left school when I was 17. In March. I walked out of school at the end of the spring term. She just walked out of school at the end of the spring term. What do you want me to say? Well, just have a word with her. <laughs> She's your, your daughter. So we're just... Uh, well, you, you, you can say the rest if you like. But just, we just started talking and I said, what do you want to do? He said, I suppose I'll go on the road. And, uh, and I did. Was, <laughs> and, and, and you did. Well, there was, there was one thing she, she, she said to her mum, which was... Uh, well, I'll just go and sign on. And she said, she, Norma's saying is you've got two good arms. You, you, you can get, you get yourself a job. You sign on, you can leave this house. Or you can go and get, get, get yourself a job and, and start bringing some money in, basically. Yeah, it was pretty much over my cold, dead body. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did actually have a job at that point. I was working in Shepherd's Purse in Whitby. At, oh, yeah. yeah, I was working in Shepherd's Purse in Whitby yeah. um, when I was... 16, 16 to about 18. But, uh, yeah, yeah, well, 16 to essentially the point at which I went on the road. Um, yeah. Uh. Well, just to interject with a bit of fandom, in, I think it was probably 1972 when I first heard uh, Bright Phoebus by your Uncle Mike and Auntie Lau. And it, it completely changed the way I, I regarded music. I'd never heard anything like it in my life before. It was like contemporary folk but not contrived contemporary folk it was just folk music written in a way that affected me and, and, and well, modern sort of times the, it was woven into a kind of new pop music in a way yeah. it, that's, then that's, that's when I decided to start writing contemporary <laughs> material that's, that was what I took away from Bright Phoebus as well is that is that the folk music or the traditional music or the idea of the, the music in the ground or in the history, as it were, was, was written into completely new music. And it's for me. <laughs> I think somebody's trying to play a bit of it, though, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to do as well, because it sounds, it sounds full of history. But it's, but it's pop music. It's like pretty psychedelic pop music. Totally, that. Yeah, totally. absolutely. I, I mean, you weren't born when it came out. I wasn't born I, I, I had the privilege of hearing Martin played on it. Uh, and, and honestly, it completely changed my whole perception of music. Not just folk music, every kind of music. Because I, I thought, here we've got something that's not observing any of you know the rules really of what you right. should do it's doing exactly what it wants to and it means so much how did you feel it, about it never it, it, it was it was not liked it was, it was rejected by everybody <laughs> when it first came out it was way ahead of its time it really was it was it was re-released i mean it became an album to have later on Album, there's a word. <laughs> but uh, it, it became what one to, what one, to, one, to, one to have, and people managed to get the occasional copies second hand. Um, but at the time it came out, it was rejected. Not by me. <laughs> I mean, well, I was just was, sitting, but, but, I was but, sitting in my little flat in North London, and I just thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard in my life. One of the few. Be Maybe glad. now. Uh, and, and later on, I got to know some of the people who played on it, like David Mattax and Richard Thompson, and all of them have said it, it was one of the most remarkable records they ever worked on. Oh, it was absolutely. just unbelievable. How are we doing for time? Are we? We, we, need, to, we need to do a wrap. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we've covered all sorts of grounds, so... What I'd like to do now is uh, turn it open to you people there. We've got a, 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 a roving mic. If you'd like to ask Martin or Eliza any questions, feel free. Just stick your hand up. Stick your hand up and we'll get the mic to you. Anything you want to know. They're a quiet bunch, aren't they? <laughs> Um, I think 
I, I think several things. I'm, I'm, able to be quite, I'm able to be quite positive because um, the idea of returning to normality in terms of being an independent musician or being any kind of musician, that's an indentured musician, someone signed to a, a major label as well, uh, the system was broken. The system was absolutely broken. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a, um, there was a sort of parliamentary, uh, one of those roundtable discussions about, the, about streaming services, about music streaming services. And that cannot be allowed to continue um, with everybody moving to sort of digital and, um, and online services. It makes the industry call it the industry at whatever level you're at, it just makes it not fit for purpose. It makes it completely unsustainable. So I'm glad that finally, that finally government is starting to take notice of the fact that since everyone is streaming and not buying albums and not buying physical product, unless it's, unless it's your sort of bespoke coffee table, limited edition, big heavy thing, you know, that you're going to want to keep forever, generally day to day people are listening to music for free and they actually can't stand and people have people are realizing that now people are moving away from companies like Spotify and more towards companies like like Quobos who pay who pay much 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 better pay something approaching a decent royalty for for music so <clears throat> i think the pandemic has forced the government's hand to a certain extent with that I also think that what it's done for independent musicians and, again, for musicians in general, is it has empowered uh, and enskilled us in... Uh, enskilled, is that a word? Uh, <laughs> to, to, to create uh, our own content, to speak directly to our fans, which um, Zoom and increased social media has allowed us to do. So most of us now know our audience by name we know what they like we know what they appreciate we talk to them every day i talk to my fans every day now i'm essentially my own social media manager and being able to sell special stuff that you know that your your audience wants is now a skill that 90 percent of musicians have because of what happened to us having said that the uh, the mental health uh, the mental health consequences are not good. And we've, not to sound like an army, but we've lost a lot of men. You know, it's, there's, there's, been, there's been a lot of heartbreak. There's been a lot of um, destitution is, is not a word to be thrown around lightly. And most of the self-employed musicians I know are also part of the excluded as well. So, like, you're not able to furlough yourself. You can't pay yourself as the, as the um, uh, you know, as the the sort of uh, manager of your own company. I mean, I have, a, I have a record label, but I don't get paid a wage, so I couldn't pay myself 80% of nothing. There was nothing there to be paid. Uh, uh, alongside the fact that getting horribly ripped off during the Wayward pro Project meant that I didn't have any tax returns to show. So, um, yeah, we were completely stuffed. But what that did do is it got us in front of our computers, it got us on our phones, it, it, it showed us how to... Like, I used to own a record label, and um, I used to own a, a, my own recording studio, and I could sit and micro-edit vocals on Pro Tools all day long. The pandemic showed me that I don't know how to plug a microphone in. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know how the program works. I just I knew it was there. It was there, and I could do that bit. I, yeah, that's great. Oh, I'm really clever, me. Um, but what I couldn't do was plug a microphone in. <laughs> so I've actually learned how to do that. And it's also, I mean, you, I'm, I'm not just talking about musicians, of course. I'm talking about live crew. I'm talking about the people that do the lights. I'm talking about our long-suffering agents. My agent has had to reschedule three tours four times in the last 18 months um, because the government was never clear about whether or not we could go back. And so, so uh, all, of, all of the, for want of a better word, echelons of the live music industry have, have suffered. Everybody, managers, promoters, crew, everyone. Um, so we are, we as a community, as, a, as an events community, are really taking control now and are much less reliant on on sort of big outside companies, we are much able to put, much more able to put on our own stuff, and I think that's that's very very important. So, to a certain extent, we've got a bit of a new dawn coming, and I think that's I think that's great. I also think it's great that we can 
we can improve the, the sort of audience numbers of any size of an event now by using live streaming. I think that's a fantastic resource. Now my fans in the US can, can watch me playing a gig in my living room or in a chapel in Robin Hood's Bay. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And it also reduces my carbon footprint because it means I don't have to get on a plane and fly there. Even, you know, we still have restrictions at the moment, but it means I don't actually have to physically do that. So I've been teaching for the Philadelphia Folk Song Society without ever having to leave the house. Uh, and whilst I miss it, I love international travel. I, I do feel better about that. Of course, we are going to this, me and dad are going to the States in about a month anyway. He's making a new album in Nashville. Um, so I'll have to find some way to offset that because I think everybody's thinking about global warming and all of that kind of stuff as well. So, you know, the fact that the conversations are happening now to me is a huge positive, but we've got a lot of people to take care of. Well, thank you very much for that, Eliza. Right then. Okay. Um, you may have noticed I stuck some flyers on your seats. I did mean to do them beforehand, but my, uh, my children are here and I was kind of running around making sure everything was sorted. Uh, so, yeah, the flyers on your seats, um, we're not carrying physical merch at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, so, uh, those flyers, which are straight out of the box, and I did wash my hands, I promise, are um, there. If you point your phone at the QR code on there, it will take you direct to our merch website where you can order pretty much whatever you want. It'll also show you all of the other family stuff um, and also the Waterson family archive recordings. We've, we're starting, we're, we've started to be our own bootleggers. So there's like uh, sort of rare demos and radio shows. There's also um, uh, Martin Carthy and Dave Swarbrick live in Belfast in 1977, was it? Give it. Give it. Something like that. Sometime when everything was in black and white and dinosaurs no, roamed no, the no, earth. No, 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 Oh, is it just you? It's just me. It's just a solo one. Yeah, there's a duo one coming out as well, as I, as I say, and as Richard mentioned, we're, uh, we're trying to get on board with the archival business at the moment. To try and, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, so that's really, really nice that you can find that by looking on the QR code there. That'll take you direct to the website where you can see the loveliness, including the incredibly tasteful limited edition Martin Carthy, the 80th birthday gold mug. They are hideous, but there's only 80 of them, so they're, so they're, they're like uh, hen's teeth or gold shoes or something. Anyway, apparently, <laughs> I heard from, the, um, from, our, from our merch manufacturer, my, my old manager, Liz Lenton, apparently they ran out of the mirror gold paint, so the new ones are sparkly. Really? Yeah. Oh my they're God. glittery. They're horrible. Please buy one. <laughs> She needs to get rid of them. Every time she goes in the warehouse, it's like, ah, my eyes! <laughs> anyway, that's the hard sell over. Buy this, it's awful. <laughs> but we're going to be doing, uh, uh, if for those of you who have not seen us before, we're going to be doing songs from the Moral of the Elephant album, which is the one with the picture of the elephant on it. So uh, you, can, you can buy that. It's right there. Uh, this is the first track on that album, and Dad's going to tell you what it's about. It's called Her Servant Man. Yes, I just call him Daddy. Huh? <laughs> Her Servant Man, I just call him Daddy. <laughs> oh. In my dreams. <laughs> Dad's guitar in my little in my little transistor, please. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this comes from a. It was. Um, was it? Yeah, it was collected by Bob Copper of the Copper family, a wonderful fam uh, musical family, and. Bob did some collecting work for, for the BBC as well, and he's, um, he knew what he was talking about, so people responded to him, and, and he met a woman called uh, 
Mrs. Uh, Grace. I've forgotten her name. How very clever of me. Oh boy. Anyway, this woman sang this song more or less like this because she 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 was an, uh, an expert in her own way of that English folk singers <laughs> and singer of folk songs uh, that that. The English, English musicians, traditional musicians and singers are very good at singing in a time signature of one. And uh, that's what she did when she sang this. The original, if, it, if there was such a thing, at one time it seemed to have been quite fashionable to do, tune, do the tunes of songs in, in five time. This is a leftover of that, but uh, people don't follow the rules, so it ended up in one. If you know what I'm talking about, I'll just Why do it in one. That? lines are true as I've been told on the banks of Shannon in a lofty mansion her father claimed great stores of gold her hair was black as the raven's feather of her form and feature dissembling can there was a fellow what on the station she fell in love with his serving man as Mary Ann and her lover were walking, her father saw them and nearer drew. And as these two lovers were truly talking in anger, home her father flew. To build a dungeon was his intention, to part two lovers, contrive a plan. He swore an oath and vowed intention He'd part his daughter from a serving man So he built a dungeon of bricks and mortar With the height of steps it was underground The food that he gave her was bread and water And just one chair for her was found Three times a day he cruelly beat her until in anger his daughter sang If I have transgressed my own dear father I'll live and die for my serving man And Mary Ann and the lover were working A father saw I've done this wrong verse Forget. Get <laughs> back in the room. Do you want to do something else and go back to it? Yeah. 
What's your happiness? No. We'll come back to it. It'll get. It'll come back to him. Anyone's got a phone? Just Google it. Other search engines are available. There's that. Use that one that plants trees. We're going to sing you this instead while it all comes back to him. This is the saddest song about happiness that we know. And it was written by Nick Drake's mum. His own families again. Happiness is like a bird with twenty wings. Try to catch him as he flies. Happiness is like a bird that only sings when his head is in the sky.
the beginning. Why not? What's the first verse? <laughs> <laughs> It's of a young damsel, handsome, those firm plans. It's all a young damsel, both fair and handsome. These lines are true, as I've been told. On the banks of Shannon, in a lofty mansion, her father claimed great stores of gold. Her hair was black as the raven's feather, about form and feature, dissemble who can. There was a fellow who worked on the station, she fell in love with this serving man. As Mary Ann and the lava were walking, the father saw them and nearer drew. And as these two lovers were truly talking, in anger home her father flew. To build a dungeon was his intention, to part two lovers contrive a plan. He swore an oath and vowed intention, he'd part his daughter from a serving man. So he built a dungeon of bricks and mortar, with a hide of steps, it was underground. The food that he gave her was bread and water, and just one chair for her was found. Three times a day he cruelly beat her, until in anger his daughter sang, If I have transgressed my own dear father, I'll live and die for my serving man. When Edwin saw that her habitation was well secured by an iron door, he vowed in spite of all damnation, he gained her freedom or rest no more. At the pound he soon got ready, with pick and crowbar he soon began, and with his pan he got in the dungeon, and there he found his sweet Mary Ann. And when that he saw that his daughter had vanished just like a lion, the father roared, the firm land I'll have you banished, with my broadsword I'll spill your gall. Then says young Edwin, you see me ready, for oh, now I've found her, do all you can. Forgive your daughter with a loyal pleasure, the one to blame is your serving man. When the old man saw him so tender hearted, straight he fell down on the dungeon floor. I surely true love will love at locksmiths, a lot can break down an iron door. I turn my my monitor right down. I yeah, I think I'll do the same. It seemed to have been it. 
So I'd better turn it back up again, haven't I? <laughs> Oops. Okay, we're going to sing you a song about a lock-in. Who doesn't like a lock-in? This lock-in, in fact, is so good that they are still singing about it over 200 years later. <laughs> it occurred at a village pub. Well, I think we think it's one of those... Um, one of those pubs that kind of is at the intersection of several villages because there are people from all around who come to this one central place to celebrate New Year's Eve in 1803. And it was written by a fellow called Robert Anderson who was known as the Cumbrian Burns because he wrote songs about his area. He wrote songs and poetry and dance tunes and stuff and it was all based in the music and characters of his local area. So, um, yeah, it, it, it all takes place in this, play, in this pub called the Johnny Dawston, which we think is like between about four villages. And they're celebrating New Year's Eve, and each verse describes what's going on in each different room of the pub. So, up in the attic, for instance, there's a load of gambling going on, a load of secret, there's a secret card game. People are playing an old game called Lanta. And, uh, and then down, um, in the sort of various nooks and crannies of the pub, all the sexy young people are all snogging each other and getting off and having a lovely time. And the old fellas are sat by the fire telling tall tales and gurning, which I quite like the idea of, just a bit of recreational gurning on a, at a party. Who doesn't enjoy that? <laughs> just take your teeth out and go for it, love. Anyway. <laughs> Said the actress to the bishop. <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't know why my hand's like this. I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, in the kitchen where there's a nice hard floor, the uh, the championship clog dancer has turned up to give everyone a bit of well clog. And um, <clears throat> it is said of him, he's a bit of a he's a bit of a local legend. And it is said of him that he can dance 20 times faster than any of the players can play. Now, I don't know if we have any dancers or indeed any, any uh, dance accompaniment people in the audience, but I can tell you as both that it's an incredibly annoying trait amongst young dancers to try and do that. Um, so <laughs> but he is having a marvellous time. And uh, as part of the description of him and what he's doing, uh, one of the very few dialect words, it was written in quite thick Cumbrian dialect originally, but uh, it got translated first by Roy Palmer, who, uh, um, and uh, I got this out of his book. It got translated first by him, and then we took a couple more words out, but we left this one in because we really like it. It says, he's dancing away, and he says he's waving his arm in the air. He's, he's, he's holding up his arm like the spout of a teapot, which I quite like. It's a bit like the Egyptian you know, sand dance, you know. But uh, <laughs> he says that he keeps snapping his thumbs for a bit of a fratch. And a fratch is a Cumbrian, an old Cumbrian dialect word for a challenge. He's looking for somebody to challenge him. He's like, come on, have a go, if you think you're clog enough, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, he's having, he's having a great time. Uh, the landlady turns up at one point with a huge piece of cheese, which everyone's very excited about. And uh, everybody basically gets so drunk that they all fall asleep in a big pile in the middle of the floor around about five o'clock in the morning, apart from one bloke who tries to leave via the door of the grandfather clock. So uh, he may very well still be there. We don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this is uh, yeah. This is called Blackwell Merry Night or Blackwell Merry Neat. And let's see if we can remember this one, eh, Dad? It's only been eighteen months or so. <laughs>
Hi, lads, such a merry night we had at Blackwell. The sound of the fiddle still rings in my ears. Oh, well clipped and healed were the lads and the lasses, and many a lively young lassie was there. Morning. The better sort they sat snug in the parlour In the pantry the sweethearts they whispered so soft The dancers they kicked up a dust in the kitchen At land to the card players sat in the loft The clogger from Dorsten's a famous top hero and he beats all the player folk twenty to one. He stamped with his foot and he shouted and roistered till the sweat it ran off of his very chin end. Then he held up a hand like the spout of a teapot. He danced across the buckle and leather to patch and they cried when he barely leapt up to the ceiling, snapping his thumbs for a bit of a Fratch. The heavy lads are well used to deep drinking At cocking the dust and us never were beat The bucker bank chaps are right famous at courting Their kisses just sound like a latch of a gate The lasses of Blackwell are so many angels Come as Dale beauties all glory and fun God help the poor fellow that squints at them dancing He'll steal away heartless as sure as a gone The backer was strong and the ale it was lively Many a one emptied a court like a churn Daft Fred in the nook like a half-roasted devil Told smutty stories and made them all good I once sang Tom Linton and all the Dick Walters Farmers all bragged at their fifties and falls They're jiving and joking and shaking and laughing Till some thought it's time to set off to the coals Yeah! When the clock struck eleven The platter was brought in with white bread and brown The knife in was sharp and the cheese was a And lumps big as lapstones our lads gobbled down The trim jolly landlady cries Do not be shy In God's name step forward now Welcome and be our guts were well filled, we paid up for blind Jenny And next paid the shot on a great pewter plate And full to the throttle with headaches and heartaches Some crept to the clock case instead of the door And sleeping and snoring took place of their roaring As once of another they laid on the floor The last of the seven long, long we'll remember At five in the morning, 1803 God had held the success to the brave Johnny Dawes To many such meetings may we live to see
thank you. Okay, this is a song that's, uh, I kind of put this together from fragments. Um, the bulk of it comes from a lady who uh, lived just outside of Weymouth. Well, it's actually now a suburb of Weymouth where she came from. But um, yes, it's uh, from Dorsetshire. Her name was Mrs. Marina Russell. And she was known for having tons of incredible fragments of songs. And when, when you think that, you know, that the, the, the sort of Victorian collectors say that about someone, I just think that they probably didn't pay her enough. It's like, you know what, you get a chorus for another tenor. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, buy us a sheep, kind of thing. <laughs> I um, have this favourite favorite story of mine about when, I, <clears throat> about when I owned a recording studio up in Scotland. We had this incredible griot come to stay with us, a very famous um, chorus player who was visiting Scotland and ended up living there in the end. But um, <clears throat> uh, my partner at the time's brother was trying to get him some gigs. So he asked if we would, if we would host him at the studio uh, so that he could make a demo. And we said, yes, of course, absolutely. And we didn't charge them anything, you know, we just did it because uh, it was in the family kind of a thing. And he came round, um, he came round and, you know, we had tea and all of that. And then uh, he went into the studio and started recording. And he basically played non-stop for about two hours. We just left it running and, you know, recorded everything that he did. And by the end of it, um, when, he was, he, was, uh, when he, was, he was getting in the car to leave, and his translator came up to us and said, I am so sorry, that was so embarrassing. I'm so very, very sorry about that. And we were like, what? We'd had a lovely time. We just, I mean, we hadn't understood anything that he was singing about, but it was beautiful, incredible choral music. He said, well, apparently, um, because, he was, because he was a griot, he was accustomed to, to being received like royalty and people were so grateful that he didn't just get a cup of tea and some biscuits, he got chickens, for instance. People would give him live chickens or give him a cat or, or a goat or something like that, something that, you know, something valuable just to, to say thank you so much for honouring our house with your presence. You know, we thought we'd, we thought we'd been, in, you know, we, th we, th we, th we thought we'd had a lovely time. And um, apparently all of the songs that he sang, he, he improvised them all. And they were all things like, I am at Ben and Eliza's house. This is horrible. They didn't give me a cat. This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is such disrespect on my family and generations of my people. I like, oh my God. <laughs> Do you remember me telling you about that? Yeah. <laughs> So yes, I have this theory about Marina Russell that, uh, that, that the Victorian collectors didn't come up with quite enough money for her, which is why she only gave fragments of songs. But the fragments that she did provide were absolutely wonderful. And the tune for this particular song is just gorgeous. So we pinched that and some of her words and then made up some bits and, and took some floating verses from other places. I mean, it is one of those songs that has traveled all over the world and been sung in many different contests. It's been sung as, uh, it's been sung as a, a sort of mourning song. It's been sung as, uh, it's been sung, sort of, it was sung during the Civil War. It's been sung as a ghost story, but uh, we, we sing it as a love lost kind of thing. It's usually called Awake Awake, but we call it Waking Dreams. So here it is. Forget. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> it's all right, I like that. 
Um, since uh, Richard mentioned Mike Waterson earlier on, I thought we'd uh, sing you one of his. I mean, it's a traditional song, but I have this theory. I call it the iceberg theory, and it's not, it's not the actual iceberg theory, it's just my iceberg theory. And it's to do with traditional songs, and it's to do with the way that they travel around the world and the way that they travel between communities and what people do with them. Because, like Dad said, the, the music itself is malleable and agreeable to whatever it is that you're singing at the time. And it, it, like he said, a modern interpretation is a modern, inter is a modern song. They are modern songs. Um, now, Died for Love, the song that we're going to sing you, um, was sort of Mike's great masterpiece, really. He took the disparate pieces, or what seemed like disparate pieces, the separate entities that, that originally made up a whole and made them whole again. Because you quite often hear Died for Love in, in little snippets. You'll hear one part of the story, you'll only hear the sea journey, or you'll hear the part where a father is going upstairs and he's going to discover something at the top of the stairs, you don't know what it is, kind of thing. And uh, so Mike brought all of those bits of the iceberg, if you like, back together. Journeys, you know, the, the, the traditional songs have journeys. They start off as one thing and then bits of them break off and float away. And he brought it all back together. This was his major work. And he was never happy enough in a studio to actually record it. So he never recorded it. And when he died, we really thought that that was going to be it. We'd never hear it again. But then um, a record came out a few years ago of um, a folk night at my, at, uh, at, my mother's, at my mother's folk club in Hull at Folk Union One from 1969, was it? 68, 69? Yeah. Something like that. Um, and there's Mike um, doing a floor spot and he sings Died for Love and it's just a flawless performance. So when we made The Moral of the Elephant, we decided to, uh, to revive it and to dedicate it to him, so that's what we do. This is the song that we pinched, with love and respect. <laughs> around with gold and his heritage 
the same color as yours. everybody thank you to Kane and big ideas and, and thank you to Richard and please thank everybody on the sound and the lights everyone that set all of this up it's absolutely brilliant so uh, fair play to you it's very nice to meet some of my fellow presenters on the radio station today it's uh, nice to see some faces it's really really great to see you thank you so much and uh, please thank Martin Carthy And also thank you, Liza Carpenter. Please don't forget to take your flyers away with you, and uh, you can hear <laughs> you can hear the songs without all the mistakes in them if you buy the record. Moral of the elephant, there it is. Might not be as entertaining though. <laughs> there's no hypno there's no hypnosis involved in the record. I I promise you. Apart from you know if you play it backwards. Finish up with John Barleycorn. Peter's Russian Tales, I don't know if you've come across it, it's by Arthur Ransom, the Swallows and Amazons man. It's a collection of, uh, of, um, of Russian, Russian stories, fairy stories, and uh, there are mentions throughout the book of these characters in Russian folklore called Muzhik, um, and he translates that as men of power, and uh, one way of looking at John Barleycorn, to, to my mind, is that this is an English, an English man of power.
And he swing and made a solemn vow John Barleycorn should die All that while they show their hand And they throw thorns upon his head And his three men made a solemn vow John Barleycorn was dead They let him die for a very long time Rain from heaven did fall And little Sir John He raised up his head Soon amazed them all Oh they let him lie Till long in summer Till he looked so pale and warm And little Sir John Got a long, long beard So he became a man So sharp, they cut him off down at the knee. They rolled him, they tied him around by the waist. They served him barbarously. Oh, they hired men, they sharp pitchforks, pierced him to the heart. But the Lord only said, and worse than that, oh, we bound him to the Little John Barleycorn Oh, they hired him with a crab tree stick They cut him skin from bone But the Lord he said him worse than that Oh, he ground, ground him between two stones John in a old brown bowl He was brandy in a glass, glass. And little Sir John in a old brown bowl He's a stronger man at last For the huntsman he can't hunt the fox Now loudly blow his horn And the tinker he can't And kettles nor pots Without John Barleycorn Solemn vow, John Barleycorn should die. 